All right, so we're back to another session of this year's Enlister Summit. Uh, today, we're going to talk about suing Miss Walker. So we're taking her to court um, and we're going to have a, a look at uh, Orne Castle versus Walker, uh, which was a case that she well, <laughs> had to deal with in the, 18, the early 1840s. My name is Marlene Oliveira. I'm a researcher, a code breaker, and also a serial lawyer of archivists and librarians. Sorry, guys. And uh, in this session, we will not talk about Gentleman Jack characters. Sorry if you were expecting that. That's not how it goes here. Um, these are all real people. So we're actually going to talk about people who existed. Uh, uh, before we start, there's a content warning. This presentation includes mentions of suicide, death, and mental illness. So if this is not your thing, please feel free to take a moment and skip this one, if you'd like. So, supposing that you are up for this, let's go. Uh, let's have a look at Anne Walker's early 1840s. And she had quite a few event eventful years uh, right at the start of the 1840s. So, uh, in 1840, she was uh, touring uh, Russia and Georgia with Anne Lister. And on the 22nd of September, Anne Lister died. Uh, then, on the 29th of September, and Walker was still in Kutaisi deciding uh, what to do next. So uh, how does she actually come back home and what does she do uh, with the um, with Enlister's remains? So later on, she eventually figured that out. And uh, when it was uh, from the 9th to the 17th of December uh, of the same year, she was in Moscow. Uh, and in Moscow, she obviously had things to deal with before she went back home. Uh, in 1841, she starts the year uh, by traveling to England via Paris. Then she gets to Halifax uh, at or around the 19th of February uh, of 1841. And Lister's remains will reach Halifax on the 24th of April of the same year and are buried at the Halifax Parish Church on the 29th. Uh, and then on the 15th of May, Anne Walker goes to York and republishes her will. Uh, in 1842, uh, there is uh, on 16th of August some unrest in England due to the Great Strike uh, and the uh, plug plot riots, uh, which also leads to some uh, less than ideal events in Halifax. People die uh, when the, the army responds to this. And if you have been to Halifax and looked uh, at the Industrial Museum, you'll see this red plaque there, which was installed, uh, if my memory doesn't fail me, sometime last year to commemorate those events. Um, if you're around and since you're there uh, looking at the Industrial Museum, why not have a... Uh, <laughs> step inside and uh, check uh, their exhibitions. Uh, great people, great um, place to visit, definitely worth your time. So on the 10th of October of that year, Anne Walker then agrees to buy the Smith House and Oil House estates. And let's go have a look at who owned uh, those. Um, oh, hold on. Before we go, about the plot, plot, the plot riots, uh, riots. Uh, Color the Libraries has a very interesting video about this, uh, which I think my COC has dropped in the chat. Feel free to have a look at that and drop them a line if you really, 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 really liked it. So moving on, let's talk about the Radcliffe's of Smith House and how they came to get Smith House. So, uh, this is a very abbreviated uh, family tree. We'll see uh, Charlotte, uh, Charles, and then William and Charlotte Lucrecia. So Charles Radcliffe's father was um, a guy named Abraham, uh, and he married the sister of the man who owned uh, Smith House. So the, the property was not in his family at the time. He married into the family, the Holmes, who actually had that. If you are interested in the history of Moravians and such, um, in the area, you'll find also some mentions of that uh, because the homes were very much into to, uh, religions uh, like that. Um, and when the wife of the, the brother-in-law of Abraham's wife died, the property passed to him and his wife. So then he had a bunch of kids. And uh, the fifth son of this, uh, of this guy, of Abraham, was Charles, this Charles Radcliffe. Uh, and he in, inherited the estate from his father. 
Uh, Charles married Charlotte Francine Ratcliffe at Lambeth, uh, and on the same day, a Captain Thomas uh, Orncastle married their sister. Do not ask me if they are cousins. I have absolutely no idea. You'd have to be a better genealogist than I am. Uh, but I have also wondered, probably they're not. But anyway, these this, uh, Radcliffe ladies were from York. So I'd say there is a chance, but not confirmed. Anyway, let's not go into that. Uh, so Charles and Charlotte Radcliffe have, had two children, both curiously deemed lunatics by Inquisition on the same year, on the same place, and with seemingly the same jury. So if you walked uh, around the center of Halifax next to, uh, I want to say McDonald's, there, there will be the Union Cross Inn. Uh, that's the place where these inquisitions took place uh, in uh, 1815, when the two Radcliffe um, children uh, got deemed lunatics. So some years later, Charlotte got sent to an asylum in New York. Uh, if you heard about the scandal of the York Asylum, where Dr. Best and Dr. Belcom once worked, it's the same one. Uh, whether she was uh, involved in that or not, I cannot tell you because I also do not know. But she died there uh, in an accidental fire in 1818. And the shock of her death was such that William Town Radcliffe tried to poison himself after his sister died. So this is actually something that Anne Lister registered uh, on her journal. So we know that he tried to, to take his own life due to Anne Lister's records. So it's it's one case in which Anne Lister's journals actually add information about other families that are not uh, necessarily uh, close to her. So there is one very good transaction of the Halifax Antiquarian Society that talks about the, the Radcliffe's, the Holmes's, and the Smith House. Uh, it's written by John, uh, J. Orsfall Orsf Turner, uh, which was one um, historian, and he published a lot of interesting stuff. I encourage you to reach out to the Halifax Antiquarian Society and request a copy. It's worth your time. Um, and if you're into curiosities, Please note that the Radcliffe's have a connection to the Pickfords, in which family tree you can find Francis Pickford, who was Enlister's friend. So, without further ado, let's talk about the purchase deal. So, uh, in 1843, uh, Orne Castle was selling his reversionary interest in the Smith House and Doyle House estates. What is a revisionary interest? So, in this context, he has a future interest in the estate of the Radcliffe's, which means that when William Town uh, Radcliffe dies, and if he dies without lawful issue, uh, so a suitable heir by law, um, it means that Orne Castle will inherit these estates. Uh, and this is given to Orne Castle uh, by Charles Radcliffe on his will. So it, the, there is a document that establishes this. So for this interest, Orncastle wants £3,750 and £4 per cent per annum in case of any sort of delay. So uh, the purchase money needs to be paid within two calendar months from the date of the agreement. So for example, Anne Walker signed that on the 10th of October. She has two months to pay. And if she doesn't, it starts to, to accumulate interest and then she has to pay that purchase money and the interest to, to close the, that. So the loans at the time were in the hands of the trustees of uh, Charles Radcliffe's will, but would be transferred once William Town died. Uh, to make sure that, that the deal was somewhat safe, Orne Castle would make a deed of title to make good on this agreement, which means that there is a legal document that says, I sold my reversion, uh, reversionary interest and then this person will get what I was supposed to get because I have this agreement that was signed as a contract between the two of us. Um, and then Samuel Washington uh, signed the, the deal on behalf of Anne Walker. Uh, if you look at this image, this is actually a copy of the original. Uh, this is just the front page. The other pages you can uh, can tell that, uh, show you exactly that it's a copy because the signatures do not match those of uh, Washington, Orne Castle, and then um, and the solicitors. So um, this copy is part of the Cronest papers. There's a second copy of a previous memorandum of agreement that was changed to originate this one that exists in, a, in an accounts folder, but it's not executed, which means it's not signed and it also is not dated. So it's a sort of draft that they had to iron out details first 
and then this one was created. Curiously enough, the date on this one is the 27th of September. So this is yet another copy of something that may or not, uh, not be the same that is referenced in the legal case. So another question here, but the, the contents match what's described on the legal case. We'll get there. So Smith House and Doyle House. Uh, here are a couple of pictures, uh, thank, um, kindly provided by the friends of St. Matthew's uh, Churchyard and the uh, members of the Lightcliffe and District Historical Society. Thank you for, for this again. Uh, the view on your left is Oil House in 2007. I am told that it's what's left of the farm. And the view uh, on your right is Smith House in 1940. If you look at the building today, it is very, very likely looking more or less the same. It's a really nice building. You can still walk past it, but please do not trespass. It's not nice. So uh, relative to Ann Walker's um, estate, um, where were these two estates? So you can see Cliff Hill uh, there, uh, more or less at the center, and then Cronest a little bit uh, lower. Uh, and if you look at this orange box that I put here, you have Smith House and Oil House and Little Smith House. So the, the properties were uh, more uh, adjacent. So if you walk that today, you can still, um, walk relatively close to those. Once again, please do not trespass. But anyway, this gives you an idea of how close she was to home and she was essentially expanding um, her land. So what happened after the agreement? A lot of stuff. A bunch of correspondence uh, went through per the, the legal case in which solicitors were tried to iron, iron out details. So uh, the idea was to draft a conveyance that uh, was uh, would safeguard the, the disagreement. So one walker would not lose value on the, the land and the, she acquired and, and the, the contents of, uh, of the land. So what does this entail? William Gray Jr. was in Walker's York solicitor proposed to include the Radcliffe trustees as parties in the conveyance. The idea here is that they will not sell more bits of that estate or um, resources from the estate. And it's, it's logic, it's, it's a smart idea. It's basically saying, I am going to close this as much as I can so my client doesn't lose any more value on her, on her acquisition. Uh, but on Castle's legal team objects, and they think that uh, the, the terms of the agreement are enough to safeguard that uh, along with the, the absence of title. So then on Castle seeks a legal opinion on the matter and forwards the opinion, uh, the information to, uh, to Gray and Gray ultimately uh, agrees. Alterations to the draft conveyance are proposed and the draft is sent to on Castle solicitors for approval. Approval is then um, obtained and the draft conveyance is then sent to on Castle solicitors for changes to be made. When the final document is created, Orncastle signs it and sends it back to his local agents or solicitors from Othersfield. And then they are supposed to bring that to one walker uh, to be signed and then they should receive the, pur uh, the purchase money. Well, there's only one small detail here. He did all this, but he then had to wait for a bit. So here's another image of, of um, Smith uh, House. So please have a quick look. Uh, it's it's really nice, and now we're moving on. So, Orncastle signed the paper. Technically, it was more or less closed, but then it he had to wait, and he kept waiting. And when the wait started to sound, seem a little bit odd, he consulted his solicitors, and the solicitors wrote to Samuel Washington asking, "Man, why are you taking so long to pay?" Uh, and then by June of eighteen forty three. It was still not paid and nothing had been signed. So Orn Castle took it upon himself to write to Orn Walker to ask, hey, I did everything I, uh, I told you I'd do. Why didn't you pay? And that letter right there is the letter he wrote to Orn Walker saying, hey, pay me. Uh, so this is part of the content. And I quote, I was greatly surprised to find this morning that the engrossed deed, although signed by me a fortnight ago and sent through uh, my solicitors in town, Messrs. Fenton and Jones, for execution by you, had not been... Oh, okay, done. This appears most strange to me after a lapse of seven months 
beyond the time of the agreement and a fortnight beyond the period of my executing it. So essentially, he signed that 14 days before, but he didn't get his money in time yet. So he was a little bit annoyed. And what did she do? Well, this is when things got interesting. So what did Anne Walker do? So she wrote back and tried to negotiate further protections for the resources on the land she was buying, essentially asking them, please don't sell any more wood from, the, from that estate. Please don't, don't work the quarries because then they will lose um, value. Uh, and she wanted to, to keep that. Then she tried to delay payment until Lauren Castle had the right in her view to dispose of the property, which would be once uh, William Town Radcliffe died which, surprise, surprise, took quite a while. And then she ultimately just refused to pay. Simple as that. The letter there is part of um, it's a, of her papers. So this is from the Cronest papers, which the West Yorkshire Archive Service, uh, Colorale, uh, kind of let me uh, show here. This is part of a series of copies she made. This one is a reply to that initial uh, letter. And it includes this extract. Miss Walker thinks that such a purchase agreement on stump uh, Ms. W uh, Mr. Orncastle will find that it is not in his power to demand money, so long as the interest upon it is duly paid, and that it really is not right to claim the payment of the purchase money for an estate until he has it in his power to yield to her the possession. So essentially she thinks that she will pay the money, the interest, however long it takes, so long as when that happens, she has a, a, a guarantee that Arn Castle can sell, which is a, a safe concern. I mean, you are buying part of, or, or part of an estate that has been there. So you want to have a guarantee that you will get what you bought for the money you bought anyway. But Arn Castle was not pleased. So then he replied with this. I have only to say that everything has been fairly and properly adjusted with your solicitor and agent. I have executed the conveyance. Nothing remains but for me to receive the purchase money and interest from you. My solicitor will write to Mr. Gray by this post, and it is with much regret that uh, I add that he considers after your letter nothing remains but to enforce the contract in the usual way. How do you enforce a contract the usual way here, you take her to Chancery. So, Orncastle versus Walker, the case, entered Chancery on the 15th of July, 1843. And with this, Orncastle wants and Walker to be called to court to answer a number of questions regarding the purchase. And to make sure that she gets an idea that this is actually official, official, on Castle solicitors serve her a writ of subpoena for her to appear in court. But she still doesn't go to court because at this point in time, somehow she decided that she will take it in, uh, on her uh, own hands and solve it. So there is a backwards and forwards between these solicitors and then Walker. And at, at the end, they just threaten her uh, a last uh, final time and tell her, please talk to your lawyers. Otherwise, if you don't show up in court to handle this, we will get um, a writ of attachment, which is a legal document that they can then pass to the sheriff and have her arrested for contempt of court. So this is serious. At this point in time, this is the mid-August 1843. She is effectively being threatened to be arrested if she doesn't show up in Chancery. And they absolutely have the power to make this happen. So... Now about the case. There are two ways to look at this, uh, the arguments for this case. One is the legal side of things. The other one is the moral side of things. So there are two arguments here, one for Owen Castle and one for Anne Walker, naturally. And uh, in a simplified way, as you can see there, I sort of cut off the legalese a little bit. Uh, Owen Castle's argument in the bill of complaint that enters chancery is more or less something like this. Miss Walker agreed to terms of the deal, her solicitors greenlit it, the necessary papers were drawn, and she refuses to pay. Sometimes she pretends I am not entitled to sell. So essentially, in his argument, he says that she he did everything he could, he contacted her a number of times, the papers were all there, and she still refuses to pay, and sometimes say, ah, I will not because you are not entitled to sell now. 
uh, Anne Walker's argument is more of a moral thing, if you will, because she, in correspondence, says distinctly something like this. I will pay with interest when Mr. Radcliffe dies, here it's William Thorn, uh, without heirs, and Mr. Oncastle is finally entitled to sell the properties. In the meantime, she needs assurances that resources on the land uh, and the land won't be sold to anyone else or otherwise used, which essentially she says, fine, I will conclude this when William Town um, dies and you inherit the property illegally, but I need to know that nobody is going to mess with that in the meantime, and it could take some time until William Town dies. Um, so... Looking at a little bit further at the case, uh, On Castle's Bill of Complaints uh, includes a number of questions for Anne Walker to answer, and these are simplified ways of, to save us some time. Um, so a few of them. The, the first bill has something like um, 15, 18 uh, uh, questions, quite a, quite a number of them, uh, and essentially includes stuff like this, uh, like, uh, didn't Samuel Washington sign the agreement on your behalf? And this didn't uh, your solicitors request changes to the campaigns which were accepted by uh, by Orntas solicitors, and then weren't you repeatedly urged to pay the purchase money? And you may be wondering if this was so serious, this was, uh, did she actually go to court after all? And the answer to that is yes. But when she appeared in court, it was after Anne Walker's lunacy um, inquisition, so she was already deemed a person of unsound mind. When she appeared in court, she essentially didn't answer any questions of the original bill. So faced with this problem, because Orncastle now uh, has a real risk of seeing the purchase not happening, and he is already trying to, to make other deals uh, for himself elsewhere and needs that money because it's been a lot of months since the agreement and he still wasn't paid. So uh, what did he do when when that uh, came up? Well, Orn Castle uh, asked the court to just summon the Sutherlands as Anne Walker's committees. I mean, the responsible was theirs now. They had, they had to do something. So a second... Uh, bill with questions is issued and it includes stuff like this. Was Miss Walker deemed a person of unsound mind by inquisition before she could answer the previous questions? And did Miss Walker enter this contract whilst she was still of sound mind or during a lucid interval? Because note that this is relevant. If she signed the contract when she was lucid or before the inquisition, the contract is valid. If it's not the case, the contract is invalid. So these are important considerations. Uh, and then he asks, well, if this is invalid, shouldn't I be compensated in case of the purchase uh, not, not being completed? Something needs to, to happen here. So it takes some time to deliberate. Some correspondence goes between the Sutherlands and the lawyer. The case is put before the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Chancellor eventually reaches a verdict. And the verdict is as follows. The cont this contract was made after the start of Anne Walker's lunacy. So technically, it's voidable, which means that they could just revert it. But there are still other, other things to, to have into account because a purchase can be made for an estate of a lunatic if it, it's proven to be beneficial to that estate. And in this case, the Lord Chancellor considered that the purchase was indeed uh, good for Anne Walker's estate, which means that it must be completed. So they have indeed to pay for uh, this, this purchase, and uh, it deliberates that the purchase money must come from the personal estate. In law, the personal estate in wills and this sort of papers, it's the person's money. So in this case, this purchase needed to come and be paid from Ann Walker's money. And the, the little snippet you see there is from the Law Times, which uh, chronicles this decision and adds some details uh, about the, the verdict. At the end, there's a bit that asks what happens if um, she happens to, to just um, die and who benefits from this purchase after she dies. And essentially, the person who benefits from this should be the heir, but the Lord Chancellor left this open and then the journalist from the Law Times added some 
some other uh, details in speculation. I cannot tell you if they actually went for it or not, but we'll see what happened in a moment. So looking now at the aftermath. So the case went to Chancery. It was a, a lot of money. They had to, to deal with Orn Castle and the, the, all the logistics of Anne Walker refusing to pay for stuff. And then eventually they had to pay. So how much did they pay? They paid uh, for this on, on May 1845. So this case is resolved in 1845. Uh, it includes interest from December 1843 to the thir uh, 30th of July 1844. It includes costs that are stuff like legal costs. And uh, it makes a grand total of just a little above 4,180 pounds. So it was costly. But if she had... Uh, continued in her course, it probably would be costlier. Uh, you may be asking, what happened to William Town Radcliffe and Smith House? Well, William Town continued to live at Smith House under the care of servants until his death in 1862. What's interesting here is that uh, when she was corresponding with uh, Orncastle Castle solicitors in 1843, and Walker estimated that William might live another 20 years. And their prediction was relatively accurate because he died some 20 oddish years or so later. So this is one case of Miss Walker, well, accidentally predicting the future. And you might be wondering, but what about Smith House? Well, Smith House was inherited by Evan Charles Sutherland from Ann Walker. And this and other properties were put uh, for sale in 1867. Uh, if you're curious about the terms of Anne Walker's will that allowed him to, to inherit this, there's um, an article that packed with potential about the wills, and uh, it should satisfy your curiosity, so to speak. So after, after this, what else is there to say? Well, pretty simple thing. I can have a, a look at these figures. You can go to, to Lightcliff, to Old St. Matthews, and across the street from the, the Sun Country Inn, there's uh, this churchyard where the old St. Matthews church used to, to stand before it was demolished. And when you enter the gate, right um, beneath that massive, massive tree on your on your right, uh, on your left, sorry, in the image, you'll see the uh, big chest tomb. And this is actually the Radcliffe chest tomb uh, which is easy to spot, incredibly easy to spot. So you could say that he ended up being, William ended up being neighbors with Anne Walker even in death because uh, the other circle in, right in the middle of where the church used to be is actually the marker of Anne Walker's grave. So they are not even that far from each other. The curiosity here is that uh, she essentially suffered more or less the same fate as William, uh, though later later in life, if you like, uh, uh, if you'd like to explore this, I would say that yeah, it's definitely worth your time. Uh, the folks at Lightcliff Churchyard have a page about the people of interest buried in this um, this uh, churchyard cemetery, whatever you want to call it. So I'd say please have a look, uh, learn about other um, stories from local history, see what you can find. And if you're cheeky, as I was in May of 2022, perhaps share a Percy Pig with Mr. Southern but then the haunting is your problem. Uh, other than that, you are very, uh, you are in for a good, uh, for a good treat, for a good walk around the, this place. Very quiet, very nice. Some very cool birds, some really old um, gravestones, always worth it. But if you go in winter, please try not to sleep and crack your skull. Okay, so now that I've that talked to you at speed, we are reaching Q and A. And before we get there, I just want to say thanks to everyone who made this possible. Summit Team, Western Archive Service, College Libraries, and folks at Old, like, um, Old St. Matthews and Lightcliffe Churchyard, uh, the Lightcliffe Historical and District uh, Society, that sort of thing. And if you'd like to get in touch, uh, this is me. Same in handle on Twitter, Instagram, and now on Blue Sky too. Otherwise, you can reach out via Pact with Potential and the Summit. And now I'm looking for questions. Okay, what happened to the, uh, the York, at the York Asylum that made it infamous? Hmm. 
This is a hard question. There's actually a lot of material about that. And if you're curious, I'm sure someone in York has studied this in detail. Essentially, there were reports of uh, bad treatment of in, uh, in bad conditions in that asylum, which didn't make a very good living experience. So while I cannot tell you if Charlotte went through that, I can tell you that later on, there is a scandal and there is a book and some other resources about that scandal that involves Dr. Best and the situation was so bad that he had to run away to the continent. I want to say France, but I, I'm probably not, not right. Um, and one of the people who wrote about that, curiously enough, was Jonathan Gray of Gray's Solicitors, who was William Gray Jr.'s father. So there is a whole connection here that, that you can explore. And Jonathan actually um, is said by his... Uh, daughter-in-law something like that to to be or to be a quite um thorough guy when he wrote that so so um i encourage you to check out this this um records if you are interested and, and have a look um another question very interesting why she didn't pay <laughs> might be that her solicitor didn't explain the reversion right to her uh not necessarily. She had an she had a pretty decent idea. It seems of what she was buying. The the hang up here was when exactly to pay because she she knew that she would only pay uh, one only receive the the actual properties once that purchase was concluded. So uh, in her view, that would not happen now. That would happen when uh, William Town died. It's not a matter of not having resources. She could very likely pay for this purchase. Um, <clears throat> but the question here is, when should you pay? On Castle says now, because that's what's in the contract. So the law will, quite frankly, most likely protect him because he has a contract that is signed that says you must pay for this within two uh, two calendar months of um, this contract being signed so if she doesn't do that once that the the papers are drawn she is in fact in breach of contract which is why he took her to court in her view that is not necessarily what should happen so it's a moral uh, problem which is a difference between what is lawful and what is right. And the uh, argument is what is right. So she feels like she should only pay when William dies, on Castle inherits, and she then gets a, assurance, a, a clear assurance that she will, in fact, get that. But, you know, we cannot uh, go back and ask questions to the dead. So I'm sure she had a very good logic for this in some capacity. Uh, this is the extent of what I understood from the documents. And again, I could be incorrect at some point, but so far it seems that um, the arguments are more or less clear. So let me see. Uh, it seems that Anne Walker's protections were reasonable. She got the changes she wanted. Uh, well, some of them. Uh, her strategy to delay full payment until she had the right uh, to convey the property seems plausible. Uh, well, she she lost the case because it's, as I explained, it's uh, what On Castle is arguing is that she's in breach of contract, of a contract she signed. So essentially, she is going back on her word um, and not exactly... Uh, following the agreement so her uh, part is relatively easy to follow her solicitors went through all the documents uh, drew up the conveyances, the deeds uh, the papers uh, that they needed they checked everything with Horncastle's people it checked out of course during the, the process at the start there were delays for example Anne Walker didn't receive a copy of uh, Charles uh, Radcliffe's uh, will as quickly as she hoped. So I, I, this is speculation. I, I got the idea that she felt a little bit bamboozled, so to speak, because since it took so long for that will to get to her, for that copy of will to get to her, they could only understand in full what exactly Orn Castle could or couldn't do after the agreement had already been signed, which doesn't help her case because it all, uh, was already signed. So Orn Castle is not going to to court to argue um, that uh, there are these technicalities. He's going just there to say, essentially, I signed the contract. 
She signed the same contract. She agreed to my terms. I followed through with everything. And she now won't sign it and won't pay me. So make her pay. Essentially, that's his argument. Go, make her pay. And she has to comply with the agreement uh, she signed. Um, <laughs> so uh, after, after that... Um, there is no way of stopping it. Well, essentially, the lunacy, the lunacy could have stopped it, but they would need to to prove that she had signed that when she was a person of unsound mind by Inquisition, uh, which is a different legal process I talked about in Summit Two, I think. Um, but once that that has been approved, uh, you still have to go through the usual checks so you can technically buy land after a person is deemed a lunatic or when uh, or after the lunacy uh, has been established by inquisition so the inquisitions have a date that say this person is deemed a lunatic from x time onwards in eliza rain's case it's like six months before the inquisition in Anne walker's case is a specific date a year before um the Radcliffe's, quite frankly, uh, I think have the generic um, wording that uh, when it happened, only God knows, but uh, this, this sort of thing, I would need to, to double check that. But since the Lord Chancellor examined the, the arguments, all the arguments we obviously hear only have one side, uh, which are the questions from Orn Castle. She, in the case, it says that she didn't, uh, didn't answer the first number of questions. What was answered in the second one, I cannot tell you because I also don't know. The case only has the bill of complaint and the supplemental bill with the second questions for the Sutherlands. There are no answers on that on that uh, particular case. If you look at cases like on uh, sorry, Walker versus Gray, will it will have the questions and the answers? So it's you get the two sides of the argument on her case, not really. So even though um, in on Castle versus Walker, our argument is. Uh, what you'd say reasonable, it is. She just wants to pay once uh, the other one inherits, in fact. Uh, legally, the contract is already there, so nothing to be done. Uh, another one. <laughs> Was the word greenlit uh, really in the solicitor's quote? No, that's me. No, that had to be simplified because in legal documents, you'll find that in wills or... Um, legal cases or other sort of, of official documents uh, of the legal kind. Essentially, what can be said in one sentence is usually added in three, four, five, six lines or more because it follows a certain um, a certain way of writing things. So you'd have, for example, each question, instead of being one line, as they could be, have uh, a verbiage so long that you can uh, have like five five lines for one simple question that asks uh, two things at most. So when Orn Castle asks if Washington was in fact authorized to, to sign this agreement, he doesn't just say, uh, I want to know if Washington signed this agreement. He actually says, your orator who is Orn Castle um, wants uh, would like to assert that this and this and that was in fact done. And if Washington was in fact allowed to ask this question, uh, sorry, that's the question, no, uh, to, to sign this agreement or uh, uh, he act otherwise acted without um, author express authorization, because that's important. For example, if Washington goes rogue here and signs the agreement without Ann Walker, uh, Ann Walker's permission, that technically could be argued depending on how good the, the lawyers are, to maybe revert the contract. So it's not there's not just one way. It depends on what you want to do. But obviously, if you look at the other papers around this, you'll see that Washington was very much doing what he had been told. Uh, and the two of them knew what was happening with, with the, every step of the way. Why she decided to just ignore her solicitors at some point and just try to go her way, I cannot tell you because I also don't know. There's no no correspondence that I've seen so far about that. But uh, at some point, William Gray is very worried about her because he sees that she will be arrested at some point, but uh, he cannot stop it. So that's when the at the end of August 1843, when that uh, very real uh, possibility that Anne Walker will be arrested uh, shows up. It's when the the 
Parker and the Sutherlands start talking about the possibility of lunacy, and then Elizabeth comes south to Halifax to deal with the, with all of this. And if you follow the lunacy proceedings, you know that uh, this came to, uh, one thing led to another. Eventually, she was removed for, from Shipden Hall, removed or take, uh, taken to York, uh, not against the rule. Obviously, there's no proof of that, uh, but essentially, go. So, another question. Uh, why did you want this land? Any specific reason beyond the usual empire building? Well, I would very much like to tell you if I knew, but sadly, she didn't leave a reasoning. This is very much uh, constructed from legal documents, correspondence, and uh, accounts at some point. So there's a, a certain number of, of uh, details. Um, other than that, you probably would like to contact people who have done the why she's building stuff. I know the people at Lightcliff Churchyard are doing working on some articles about her acquisition. So pr probably send them uh, an email and um, ask. Other than that, I'm just sticking to Orn Castle versus Walker here. And I, the only thing I can tell is that at some point she wanted to buy land and then it went very, very, very wrong. So, uh, we are more or less at time. Uh, anyone, if anyone has any other questions, please drop in chat so the um, TLC can send it to me. Otherwise, I'm giving you two minutes and then I'm preparing for the next one. Anyone else? Perhaps not. So, thank you all again. Uh, any questions about acquisitions, please send them to the folks at Lightcliffs. I'm sure they'll be very, very happy to help you. Um, with that question. Other than that, uh, if uh, we will eventually update on Castle versus Walker and Pax with potential with uh, much better uh, and more accurate details than I can do in 45 minutes. Um, other than this, I hope you've enjoyed the session. I will then um, show up again with my great uh, teammates in the um, Listers Web session show up, uh, find out all about these women in Enlister's life and how it went very, very interesting uh, after some point. So this is it for me. Enjoy yourselves.